Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, the weekly libertarian podcast that refuses to drop out of the 2024 presidential campaign. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, everyone. Howdy, Matt. Hi, Matt. Happy National Ice Cream Day. I'm not kidding. Okay, on Sunday, after three absolutely miserable weeks of insisting that everything is fine, dot gif, President Joseph Robinette Biden II, under intensifying pressure from fellow Democrats who are understandably worried that his obvious age-related decline made him unlikely at best to uh, beat Donald Trump, finally withdrew from the 2024 presidential race in a social media post, as they say nowadays. The president wrote, quote, while it has been my intention to seek re-election, I believe it is in the best interest of my party and the country for me to stand down and to focus solely on fulfilling my duties as president for the remainder of my term. 27 minutes later, Biden offered, quote, my full support and endorsement for Vice President Kamala Harris to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. Since that moment, Democrats seem to be coalescing or at least coagulating behind the vice president with uh, party heavyweights such as Bill and Hillary Clinton, Gavin Newsom. Uh, And all 50 state Democratic Party chairs offering their full support. Uh, Independent Senator Joe Manchin for a hot minute said he was considering a run at the nomination, but then ruled it out on the state television program Morning Joe just this morning. Uh, No other non Marianne Williamson candidate has yet revealed his or herself uh, as of 11 a.m. Monday. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama, notably, um, uh, both were reportedly some of the main players behind pushing Biden off stage. Um, they have not yet backed a candidate. Um, it may also be worth pointing out that Michelle Obama, the best selling nonfiction author in America, uh, has at least three times uh, been polled by Gallup as the country's most admired woman. Republicans uh, who held their uh, pretty successful uh, national convention in Milwaukee last week, which we'll talk about here in a moment or three, have mostly reacted to the news by laughing at Kamala Harris's uh, record of managing the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border uh, and by saying that Joe Biden uh, should also step down as president. Catherine, uh, we had a hell of a year last week. Uh, What is your uh, general reaction to the events as someone who I know was following it very closely for The New York Times? Yeah, I mean, I'm just happy that it's Friday already, Matt, because um, so I think that the main reaction that I have to the rise of Harris is that I am I'm like so happy to just have a regular politician who has really, really bad ideas like I, I she sucks. She's so bad. Donald Trump also sucks and is so bad. But uh, his speech at the end of the RNC was a reminder that in some ways he is just on a very deep level, not a regular politician and not in a good let's shake up the status quo and change America for the better kind of way, just in a like what the fuck kind of way. Um, (laughs) And Harris is just a regular politician who is bad. Um, Remind me of like this moment of like slight happiness I had about her in two years when President Harris is ruining America, please. So wasn't that also the argument for Joe Biden in 2020 was he was just a regular politician who was bad? Yeah, And that was the best argument for him in 2020. And it just so happens that he became not a regular politician anymore because he became a very, 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 very old man, not a regular politician. Well, it should be pointed out that regular politicians are very, very craven, egotistical country, not quite first. So bad. uh, Human Yes, I didn't say that. I'm just trying to maintain myself. Nick, we've uh, talked about on this program uh, the Democrat and media gaslighting that led up to Joe Biden's disastrous debate performance 24 or five days ago uh, and continued even afterward uh, and is arguably kind of ongoing today in various permutation. What in your mind has been Kamala Harris's contributions to that particular genre? Oh, there are endless clips of her talking about how Joe Biden is, you know, he's getting smarter and younger in office. I mean, uh, uh, beginning this year, as the question about his infirmity came up, she was always right there to be like, the, you know, she makes uh, uh, she makes Joe Scarborough look like faint of heart 
when it came to saying that Biden is, you know, is just super duper. And you can you can you know wave that away by saying that, well, she's the vice president. Of course, she has to support him. It's like, no, actually, she doesn't or she's going to have to live by that. Um, and I think it presents the most obvious point of entry into a critique of her that the Republicans will make, but I think mainstream Americans will also buy, is that either she was lying all along and hence is, you know, awful, or she's so out of it based on her own giggle, you know, uh, you know, giggle fits and everything like that and her own kind of weird sayings, which, you know, are, are her legend, um, that she's worthless as a judge of character. So the question um, and, is like whether she herself just fell out of a coconut tree or whether she thinks everybody else fe just fell out of a coconut no, tree. But this is she is, um, you know, she has a lot to uh, make up for in a relatively short period. Plus, she has to introduce herself as a presidential candidate with a program in her statement, you know, accepting Joe uh, Biden's, uh, you know, kind of nomination. The first thing she went to was she's going to unite the Democratic Party and then she's going to, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, the uh, Heritage Foundation's 2025 plan doesn't get enacted. So she does not have a positive vision and she's got a lot to answer for. And I think people in the middle are like, I don't like the way this is unfolding. Like, why didn't why didn't this process start sooner? Why is she just getting the nod no matter what? I, I just from a process point of view, I think she's pretty fucked. Peter, um, we've seen some reactions. Lord knows I had to listen to some reactions because I was driving and listening to NPR have a special uh, coverage of this yesterday. And not just the various uh, Democratic uh, drones who were brought on to talk, but the announcers themselves were just talking about what a legendary, historically significant president Joe Biden uh, has been. Up Consequential. To consequential uh, super is. consequential jonathan last from the bulwark uh says our greatest living president uh sarah longwell also from the bulwark calls him a national hero john meacham who is the sort of historian uh biden whisperer uh has a big uh very solemn piece in the new york times today calling him an american hero uh my question <laughs> is am i taking just crazy like pills? G. joe just yeah. like a real our, american our hero greatest generation yeah, uh am i taking crazy pills are americans just like we didn't understand during this entire presidency when his approval rating has been about 40 percent um that are just americans too stupid to realize what a great president he's been matt the question of whether you are taking crazy pills is not one i can answer uh yes. consult with your doctor uh maybe Answer's look at no. your your uh look at the medical shelf in your bathroom i don't know man um our uh are Americans that this is actually maybe the, the, the better way to think about this question is, um, are Americans taking crazy pills or do they accurately accurately assess the sitting president? And there has been this running argument from Biden uh, partisans over the past uh, year in particular, as he is, you know, sort of ramped up his presumptive run. I guess it was not a, it was it was a run for president, except, well, now it's not one um, as he ramped that up, that, in fact, Americans just severely underappreciate Biden's gifts to America and how much he has done for this country. Biden himself made a version of that argument uh, all last summer in 2023. He barnstormed the country, making all of these speeches about the, the greatness of Bidenomics. And Bidenomics was really principally built on three big pieces of spending legislation. You had the Chips and Science Act. You had the Inflation Reduction Act, which wasn't really an inflation bill. It was mostly a climate and energy bill. And then you had the American Rescue Plan, which was the two trillion or so uh, partisan, you know, uh, deficit funded bill that they just grab bagged everything on the Democratic Party agenda into this uh, thing right after they uh, right after Biden was elected, uh, said it was because of covid. Very, very little of the spending was directly related to the pandemic but it was like oh th if that's your that's your legacy that's what you did that and a bunch of antitrust cases that failed i don't know I, it doesn't seem like he was the greatest american or american president of the last couple of years it just he doesn't seem us like out that of covid uh, that's right uh, peter he pulled us out of covid this is all uh, npr yeah. channeling here uh and he um he you know the economy was in a horrifying depression when he took over uh right the unemployment rate uh, excuse me, the 
uh, the inflation rate when Joe Biden took over was sub 2% and it rose to 9 point something percent, a 40 year high a couple of years after office. And per, and maybe, maybe there was a connection that Americans accurately or more or less accurately anyway, perceive between a bunch of massive spending bills, which is what Joe Biden said Bidenomics was, and a massive run up in inflation. Catherine, uh, you're a lady. Uh, when I was listening to uh, NPR, um, someone asked very gingerly the question like, well, you know, um, we all know Kamala Harris is great and everything, uh, but she did run for president last time and it didn't go that great. Uh, <laughs> and she's not always a thousand percent popular. Um, so how is this going to be different? And one of the answers was, well, she has this whole record of accomplishments to run on um, since she's been vice president. Uh, and Wait, what, uh, what was that record? See, that's what uh, the four Did they people say? in our I'm car. Sure I want to know now. Well, uh, it just basically was, you know, she was right there in the room when Biden was doing all the things <laughs> that Peter just talked about that had no <laughs> negative consequences in their delivery of it. But mostly that she is going to be good on abortion. It's not really a legislative record. It's uh, that um, she's a lady and she's also the uh, president and the administration's point person in talking against a uh, Republican position on abortion post Dobbs. Catherine, you're a lady again. Um, do you think that this is going to be, do you foresee this to be a, like the main thrust of the campaign and be effective? Uh, I do think Joe Biden basically did to Kamala Harris what you do to me week after week on this podcast. Like, I think he looked at her and was like, you're a lady. So um, yeah. I'm, I can't I'm not Even good at better, talking about you're, abortion. Uh, she is a black and South Asian Indian lady. As is Kamala. Um, I can't bring that to this podcast. But um, so, you know, I am I'm extremely, extremely pro-choice. I am radically pro-choice. I think that that's ex that's consistent with the libertarian idea that this should be a decision that uh, is about bodily autonomy and exists at the individual level. Kamala Harris is also extremely pro-choice, but she is pro-choice uh, in in the kind of opposite way procedurally. So her deal is um, we're going to give the Justice Department oversight over state abortion laws. And um, that proposal has the same structure as the Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court has basically said, like, that's not constitutional. Like, we can't do it that way. Um, I think it's it's very clear that we could constitutionally, like, Congress could make laws about abortion. Th that's like a, I don't know, that's how we do laws is the Congress makes them. Um, and uh, Speak and this for yourself, thing yourself, lady. The thing that could, the thing that Harris has proposed to the extent that she has a concrete proposal, which is not always clear with her, um, seems to me to be pretty unconstitutional. It seems to me that, um, you know, her attitude is uh, not only will the, the DOJ have this kind of preclearance right until the DOJ approves state level laws, they won't go into effect. That's what she said in 2019. None of that is procedurally correct. So, um yeah, I think she probably will run on abortion. And I think that that will be a good thing for her campaign because we've seen that voters care about that. But her actual proposal is unconstitutional and probably not workable on a variety of dimensions. So in the end, is she going to actually end up protecting women's rights to have abortions? I don't know. I think she might screw it up. You know, Trump in Trump in the presidential debate had a very good answer for the abortion question where he said, I brought it to where everybody always wanted it. And he was kind of overstating and misstating things. But he was channeling Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the early 70s. And he said it's being decided at the state level. Some states are going to be, you know, very, you know, uh, prohibition, prohibitionist of others are going to be wide open. And he was OK with that. And that you know, uh, that's what gave uh, Biden the opening to start talking about incest, uh, you know, at length. Um, but, you know, Trump, Trump, unlike, I think, some uh, Republican politicians like J.D. Vance, he is not talking about a national abortion ban or anything like that. He actually is very happy and he's got a story that he seems to be sticking with, which is that the Supreme Court justices he nominated returned it to the states where it should have always been. I don't agree with that, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm with Catherine. I mean, I think this should be uh, an individual right that is not, uh, you know, uh, restricted in it by which state you live in. 
But Trump has a very good answer to that. And I also think the focus ultimately, if Trump and the Republicans can at all remain kind of positive, which is a gigantic if, the question for Kamala Harris is like, what is her positive program other than saying, you know, I'm not Trump, uh, which might have worked and did work in 2020. So I on abortion, very specifically, now. I do I do think that she. Uh, uh, my recollection is that she has been supportive of the uh, Democratic Party legislation or proposals to publicly fund abortion, and that is, uh, if you want to call it a positive proposal, I wouldn't say that we. It's not positive in the sense that the four of us support it, um, but it is a thing that she would do that would be different. And but that's that's always been a little bit of a ping pong ball, right? Yes. Like Democrats come in, they they fund Planned Parenthood. The Republicans come in, they defund it. Like that's just a, that's one of those things. I, the other piece of it, I think, is, um, you know, what Nick said is right. The most recent thing Vance has said seems to more or less match up with what Trump said during the debate. But one thing we saw is the minute that Dobbs came down, a good percentage of people who had previously been abortion federalists turned on a dime, like just immediately, immediately were like, great, thanks for that. Now on to the national ban. And I think we would do well to keep that in mind. Trump has been a check on some of the more radical impulses of the Republican Party on abortion because Trump actually isn't isn't that hardcore on abortion. Like he just never has been. And um, the post Trump era could, I think, go a lot of different ways, most of which would probably be more prohibitionist. Also, predict- Trump is not that hardcore and he can read the polls or at least sense them in some sort of like uh, instinctive sub, you know, right, like subconscious. Like he's they actually got just a, permeate a, his skin, which is a, a uh, an unusual membrane different than what the rest of us have. No, it's literally it's a them. it's a spidey sense. Right. And like when polls happen, he doesn't read them. He never looks at the cross tabs. It's just that he's got those little jaggy lightning like lines that like come out of his head, just like Spider-Man. I thought you were going to say his skin is threat orange level, uh, threat level orange. Uh, threat orange level. I saw open up for Fugazi in, uh, in <laughs> yeah, that 1996. Right. Oh, they're awesome. Uh, they didn't I, have my, a drummer. Very interesting. My uh, prediction is that J.D. Vance on abortion will be what Paul Ryan was on entitlement <laughs> reform <laughs> in 2012. <laughs> Um, there That's will, a mean sentence. It's a mean <laughs> and true sentence, which is that the president is the president or the top of the ticket is the top of the ticket and the uh, bottom of the ticket will eat uh, a lot of things, including on uh, raising corporate taxes, which J.D. Vance wants to do. And Donald Trump wants to do the uh, opposite of Nick. You asked on Slack earlier. Mm-hmm. And I don't mind mentioning this out loud. Yeah, I thought uh, that was a private conversation. But it was until now. Uh, from a libertarian perspective, <laughs> what does Kamala yeah. Harris have to offer? So please answer your own question, if you would. Um, I would note that our uh, colleague, Matthew Petty, has on our site this morning a piece under the headline, Could Kamala Harris Be an Anti-War Candidate? Yeah, so I'm going to channel Edwin Starr, uh, the uh, hitster behind war, and I'm going to say absolutely nothing. Uh, Kamala Harris... Uh, did take a lot of credit for earned, unearned, I'm not sure, for the First Step Act or helping to push that through. Uh, But as our Elizabeth Nolan Brown and other people have pointed out, as a prosecutor, um, she was not particularly progressive. uh, And I'm not sure that that comports fully with a libertarian perspective, but um, she's a big government person. She likes to regulate. She likes to spend money. She likes to get the government in, in between people who are making deals and things like that. I think on the war stuff, it'll be interesting to see. And this is also, she's trying to unite the Democratic Party. She has been very outspoken about uh, uh, Israel policy, which is going to cause more tension within the Democratic uh, coalition. There's already been a massive fracturing about that since October 7th. So I don't see her as being um, necessarily better than Donald Trump when it comes to foreign policy. Trump has actually been a, a pretty good real politic uh, politician. So if that's the best that she's got, well, you got that with Trump. And then from a libertarian perspective, you have other things that kind of actually make Trump the less bad alternative. Catherine, uh, we famously had a cover line uh, saying Kamala Harris is cop. Um, I see already preliminarily some Republicans bashing Kamala Harris for being anti-cop. So which is it, Catherine? 
I think you can uh, be a cop and be anti-cop in those two oh. senses very, very easily. Okay. Um, her kind of cop is uh, is the nice, nice little cop behind the desk cop uh, doing doing prosecutorial things, kind of clean hands coppery. And uh, she's against, um, you know, the cops that are out there in the street beating people up. It's fine. It's all fine. Um no, it's of course, of course, these are of a piece. And of course, you can't really be both. Um, she, you know, her inclination, it seems as far as we can tell, which we don't have a ton of clarity, is to always lean into giving agents of the state more power, um, especially when it comes to corporations, but also when it comes to individuals. And so, uh, you know, I think on some level, this has been a, a tension within the Democratic Party for a long time is like you at some point. Every time you make a new law, you are empowering the cops, however you want to understand that term. All laws you have to be willing to enforce at a point of a gun. And Kamala Harris, in almost every pl place where you can compare the policies that she's proposed to the policies that Biden's proposed, it's all Biden plus one. It's all like do what Biden would have done or Biden did do, but a little more so, a little more progressive, a little more technocratic, a little more regulatory, like a little more pushing the envelope on power. and. You know, in the end, that's that's that that's the cop impulse is like just take more power for the state and then use it at your discretion. And let's also remember that she was a main figure in um, spearheading the prosecution of the back page um, uh, defendants, people who were running an online classified site site uh, at which some sex workers and clients were introducing themselves to one another. She prosecuted them very loudly in California as attorney general, and then later backed a lot of things against them uh, when she was in the Senate um, uh, as uh, being a child sex traffickers, even though there's never been any charge remotely related to that. Um, trotted them, uh, you know, put them in monkey suits in front of uh, like orange jumpsuits in a cage in a courtroom in California uh, on a case that was almost immediately thrown out. Um, but yet there's many cases as we will probably be talking about at the end of the podcast when we talk about New York City events. But she is absolutely the villain in that story, um, as far as I'm concerned. Peter, uh, a lot of people are saying, by which I mean me, uh, that uh, Kamala Harris has uh, is one of the most spectacular uh, failing upward politicians in American politics. Is th That could be unfair. So as, is there any evidence that you have seen being fair minded? that uh, Harris is a talented or popular politician or is particularly any good at being a public office holder? So first of all, it's just not that spectacular, the failing upward. It's it's kind of it's kind of upsetting, frankly. What's happened is that she just keeps being promoted. So I don't think she is very talented as a politician in the traditional sense. I think she's less talented than Donald Trump and less talented than Joe Biden, both of whom, uh, uh, it, you know, it, Donald Trump sort of built uh, a, a political platform for himself after not having had a career in politics, just having had a public persona. Joe Biden was in politics for 50 years and won a lot of elections. Yes, he also uh, blew it in many cases, but he won a lot of elections, seemed to actually have his finger you know, on the, the pulse of a, was sort of what a, a certain type of middle American wanted, at, at least at times uh, during his career. And he was pretty good at being a politician, which is definitely, I just want to be really clear, not an endorsement of the stuff he did as a politician. What Kamala Harris is really good at is not so much being a politician in the Joe Biden or the Donald Trump sense. Instead, she is very good at working the inner mechanisms of the Democratic Party, and in particular, the Democratic Party, where it doesn't really interact with uh, Republicans or have any competition. So places like California, and that's why she came from California. That's why she ended up uh, on the, as the vice president, the one the job you can get in politics, if you didn't win the election, if you didn't sort of win the, the public, right, if the, the public didn't come over to your side, but instead the, the party insiders and the party mechanisms, you're good at working them and you're good at working those players. And that's what she's good at. That's why the party is lining up behind her right now and essentially sort of walking her to a coronation without uh, the kind of open contested, con you know, uh, replacement race that you might expect, um, especially given her track record. She has she has never never run a race where she has to convince swing voters, where she has a really, you know, um, where she has to 
bring, you know, where there are Republicans who matter, um, right? She's basically only ever succeeded in all Democratic spaces. And she's really only succeeded in elite Democratic spaces where she's just sort of working the the power players in the party and um, in, sort of, uh, in the surrounding culture. Could we nominate George W. Bush as a, a potential rival failing up candidate? Hmm. Well, he was a pretty good governor of Texas. There was like a lot of a lot of like screw ups with no consequences in that man's life. Yes, but he at least like was a decent that governor. kind of he, ended after he entered politics. So that is true. Uh, you know. Nick, uh, uh, I know that you really, really, really wanted to talk about the television show Veep at various points in this podcast. I understand on the Internet that um, there are some parallels um, for that program uh, to what is happening with Kamala Harris. Do now, wish- now that, uh, you know, history is first, uh, you know, being written as farce, uh, we're in for the tragedy part of that, Matt, because okay. the the TV show Veep really kind of predicts how this type of stuff happens, where, as Peter was talking about, somebody who's a marginal politician ends up, you know, in the, in the Oval Office. Spoiler alert for the people who haven't watched Veep yet. Uh, apologies. But um, I mean, I I think the, the question here is whether or not the Democratic Party is essentially taking a loss now. And, and this is beyond any issues of whether or not the Republicans can screw it up because they always can. They did this in 2022 when they should have won massive majorities in both the House and the Senate, and they did not because they suck. But to me, it's it's meaningful that Kamala Harris is not out of the gate with something uh, of of a, of a large project that is going to underwrite, uh, or even a theme that is going to underwrite her candidacy, because you've got to look at it that Biden is in the past. You've got three months, less than three months, to win the presidency. What is your positive program? Who are you talking about? Who are you speaking to? Who are you bringing into the Democratic Party that isn't already there? Um, and Trump, you know, the Republican National Convention. Whatever else you can say about it, it was uproarious. It was generally positive. It was extremely high energy. Um, is the DNC like the the Democratic Party has to have its shit together before the DNC, and then that has to be a hoot and holler and like fantastic, spectacular celebration of what a great world it would be if Kamala Harris and whoever her vice presidential candidate is get elected. Um, and, you know, I realized what we're, you know, like 24 hours into her candidacy. And basically all we have so far is her talking about we've got to stop Trump and the Heritage Foundation. Like, it just seems to me they're taking the loss. Somebody like a Gavin Newsom should have been Reaganite, uh, like Reagan was in 75 and 76, when he immediately started going after Ford, even though it was extremely unpopular and he attacked him. He lost there, but set himself up. Uh, for a major victory in 1980. The fact that none of this is happening, it just seems to me what we're seeing is the melting away in the rain of a paper mache party. Uh, you know, and there's a Republican version of this too. Uh, but, you know, it's this is a concession in many ways that the Democrats know they are not going to win the presidency. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also notable that the, the the individuals who might have a better shot, which is not to say um, uh, it's just a better shot than Kamala Harris, which is not to say I think they're likely to win. The individuals who might run uh, against Trump, who might try to who might try to get the nomination other than Kamala Harris, uh, someone like um, uh, Gavin Newsom or um, Whitmer uh, in Michi- Michigan, uh, Gresham Whitmer are the two most commonly named people. They're deciding not to run. They are saying we don't want to do this now. They're letting Kamala Harris take this nomination. And I think that's partly because they see this as, uh, as you said, I mean, as a loss, like it's it's not clear that there is any Democrat who can beat Donald Trump in November uh, because the Democratic Party, the apparatus, even the people who are not connected directly to Joe Biden, uh, persisted in this very obvious lie for a year, at least, if not for several years. And the way that the Democrats have treated Joe Biden and Joe Biden's age and his obvious decline, especially over the last couple of months, but really over his entire presidency, uh, it's just it's so obviously fake. They so obviously lied to all of us. Everyone could see it and they eventually had to admit it. And that means that there is going to be a massive trust deficit with 
any Democratic candidate this year. And so anybody who just, you know, who runs and who gets the nomination, whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Whitmer, Whitmer whether it's uh, Gavin Newsom, any candidate at the top of the Democratic ticket is going to be saddled, not just with the Biden record, you know, and the, all of the policies, but with this huge trust problem with having to answer for why did so many people in the Democratic Party lie to the American people? And there's not a good answer for that. Uh, Peter, I think just to underline your point, but also to tie the room together with Nick's earlier point, uh, that's true. And also the politician that is the most implicated in that in the Democratic Party is Is Kamala Kamala Harris. Harris. Yeah. Congratulations, America. Uh, All right. We're going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, friends, I've got one word for you. Senolytics. That's right. Senolytics is a class of ingredients discovered over the past decade that could be a bombshell for promoting healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime. Here's how Senolytics work. As we age, everyone, even Melania Trump, uh, accumulates senescent cells in their body. Uh, Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging, aches and discomfort, slow workout recovery, sluggish mental and physical energy. Uh, These zombie cells are old and worn out, taking up space and nutrients from your healthy cells. Uh, but now you can prune these dead cells off your burning bush by taking Qualia Senolytic. Qualia Senolytic is a vegan, gluten-free, non-GMO supplement, and you only need to take it twice a month to remove those zombie cells and halt the barbarians of aging at the cellular gates. So go to neurohacker.com slash roundtable right now and get a 20-day, 20, uh, 20 screw a 20, 100-day that's right. I'm quintupling it here. A uh, hundred day money back guarantee up to $100 off. And when you use the code roundtable uh, at checkout, yet another 15% off the ticket price. That's neurohacker.com slash roundtable. Attack those zombie cells. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Jamie Lewis, who writes, After the assassination attempt on former President Trump, someone in my community posted a comment on a news report saying, so close. This comment was picked up by the Twitter account Libs of TikTok. The commenter's place of employment was listed in his bio, and his employer was apparently receiving calls uh, for his termination, and the restaurant itself was receiving bad social media ratings. The employer at first suspended the poster and later terminated him for violating their social media policy. While I think the post was in bad taste, I don't think taking it out on his employer is called for. On the employer's side, they were screwed either way. Keep getting harassed for employing him or firing him for his speech on his own time and personal account. So should employers be held responsible for the expressions and actions of employees on their own time? Should employers enforce codes of conduct for employees outside of work? Catherine, you have employees. Sometimes they do things outside of work. Should you fire them? I should absolutely <laughs> fire all of them. Thank you for asking. Um, so this is this is cancel culture. We're back in the cancel culture culture discourse. Hooray. I love it here. Um, and, you know, I think the, the problem is everything can't be about everything all the time. Right. And and that's that's where we are, is every tweet is a reflection on the multinational corporation that employs you. Uh, every HR decision is a you know, is a political comment like. This is not a healthy way to function. This is not working. It's not working for anyone. As the question writer notes, um, everyone's kind of hemmed in from both sides in their decision making, which is uh, which is not a good place to be. Um we have at-will employment in this country, and I think it's one of the greatest things about our country, really underappreciated uh, as a, a thing that keeps our society um, sort of dynamic and innovative and functioning decently well, at least some of the time. That means basically like your employer should be allowed to fire you for a lot of reasons. And I think it is fair to say that one of them might be, hey, stop embarrassing me. Like <laughs> You're fired. That's OK. That that should absolutely be legal. That said, I don't think it should be customary. It shouldn't be called for. It shouldn't be usual. Um, And uh, and it's really hard to get back to that place where where that isn't the case, because that's a cultural change. It's not something you can make a rule and fix. Um, It has to be kind of a change in attitudes. I do think we've seen a little bit of movement in the right direction 
on uh, universities uh, and college campuses. Uh, this sort of move after the um, the Israel protests to say, hey, we're not going to issue formal statements on everything just f- because anymore. Um, a bunch of campuses have decided to do that uh, to the extent that this type of cancel culture originated on campus or kind of found its footing on campus. Uh, the fact that at least the formal institutions of universities are moving away from everyone has to have an opinion on everything and it has to be in line with some imagined standard, I think is a good thing. So maybe that's the start of a cultural movement in the right direction. But um, but I think we're, we're going to be back in the cancel culture discourse for a while here, unfortunately. And uh, it's a dumb place where everyone is a hypocrite. Uh, Nick, how would you answer the question? And I'll append another. Uh, is it, Are we all mm. better off muting libs of TikTok? Yeah, that's for sure. She uh, She's a blight upon the country. Uh, but I, you know, I think from a perspective uh, of of both an employer and a customer and things like that, I think what the uh, what the business owner should have done is talk to the person, probably suspend them, and then say, you know, this person does not represent the business, and we've taken care of it, and then you know, let her come back or let the employee come back. I, you know, I'm thinking about the uh, the Home Depot woman who got. Uh, you know, got mouthy with a customer and that led to her being fired. Um, you know, on a certain level, if I owned a business and my cashiers were wading into really fraught, controversial political comments, I would be like, would you shut the fuck up? Like, nobody cares what you think. So shut up and just do your job on the same token. Like, you don't want to live in a world like Catherine's talking about where every stray comment by a waiter or a custodian or a vice president you know, that has nothing to do with your business, then becomes some kind of national controversy. And I think it's really up to employers to kind of police their workplace, but also then respond in a way that makes sense. Um, you know, and I think we, we've we been overreacting on all of this stuff all the time. Um, we should be talking about Jack Black. Why did he, you know, why did he put his Tenacious D uh, colleague, you know, he he sold him out immediately. Why didn't he back him up? There's like, Lots of ways of talking about this, and the fact is, is that we are we're in we're still in a very stupid place when it comes to this. And it's never a bad thing to say, "Hey, you know what? I fucked up, and I'm going to take a chill pill, and you know maybe I'll be back." Uh, but I I find that snap decisions, you know, w- the milkshake ducking of America is is not a good place to hang out. There's also a pretty important distinction, I think, between on the job conduct and outside of work conduct, right? So I think. A, a, as far as I can tell from this letter, a, a tweet totally outside of work business seems to me to be a very easy call to set a general cultural expectation that that should not be a deal breaker for your employment. But, you know, ha- haranguing someone while they're just trying to buy two by fours is a totally different deal and seems to me to be very much fair game for a uh, firing. Uh, on the tenacious D front, I heard a very plausible sounding um, conspiracy theory uh, which is that they're kind of on tour. They don't like each other anymore. It's an old band kind yeah. of playing the old hits. And like, how can we get out of this one? <laughs> I discovered. Were you horribly- looking for for ideas? Yeah. Are you, for some are you reason? telling us something, Matt? Um, I actually discovered horribly that I have like surprisingly large amounts of Jack Black knowledge when that controversy popped up. Like, wow. The kids, I don't know, man. Like, I literally don't know why this information is in my brain. But, like, the kids at the office were like, I thought Jack Black was, like, a nice, cuddly guy. What could these tenacious D fellows be up to? And it's like, it's they have songs about getting raped by the devil, my friends. Like, I yeah, know you're he, fooled. He it's was in one of the uh, movie that would be, is almost unwatchable today, much less unfilmable, right? And yeah. Tropic Thunder. Uh, I thought but you were his, talking about The but Holiday. His, but his so mom great. helped land people on the moon. So it's all, it's very confusing. You know, with anyway. Did you just start quoting High Fidelity, like just basically the yeah. entire script falling out of your nope. mouth verbatim as nope. soon as the kids that in the office? That happens to you sometimes, or- <laughs> I know. But, no. No, but you know, Matt, I to go back confused. to it, part of, part of it is the, the role of employers in, in all of this, in setting expectations both for their employees, but also for their customers and just saying, yeah, you know what, like we're, we're not going to go along with the most ridiculous extreme thing i mean most most cancel culture battles will stop if people stop feeding it you know over over a 72 hour period so i would uh i would uh highlight um and set up 
as an exemplar. Uh, uh, our friend Noam Dorm Dorman from the mm -hmm. owner of the Comedy Cellar, who also has a great uh, podcast that Nick has been on uh, called Live from the Table. Nick's also interviewed him for the recent interview with Nick Gillespie. Um, but very soon after October 7th, and no Noam is a very, very committed uh, defender of Israel and a kind of a public kind of uh, intellectual talking about this. But he also said then and now that, you know, if my employees come to work wearing a free Palestine or more uh, extreme than that um, button on their lapel, fine. I want uh, want a workplace where I'm not policing the political speech of my employees, even if I find it uh, abhorrent. I don't think that uh, Noam should write the laws of this country, but I do totally appreciate that uh, as an ethic. That's probably even like farther than I would go if I was in any position like that. Peter, briefly, what is your uh, take on this uh, question? Never tweet. Don't yes. read tweets. Don't send them. Just never tweet. All right. Take. Thank you for the brevity of your wits. Um, let's get to, while we still have time, last week's other big news, which is that the Republican Party held its quadrennial uh, convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it was kind of a spectacle. You had the uh, Teamsters Union president giving the keynote on the uh, first night, uh, talking about how bad the Chamber of Commerce was. Uh, you had a uh, OnlyFans porn gal, uh, Amber Rose, uh, giving a pretty moving speech. Uh, and also an even more moving Trump, Trump baby video. It, so uh, just a, like a little matter of actual kind of factual correction or, or question there. It, she's got an OnlyFans. I, I, I have read a headline saying that it's inaccurate to describe her as a porn star. OK, uh, I, I said that, which is different. And okay, I did say fine. or. Uh, but thank you for Andy leaving me. Uh, there was a whole bunch of stage time uh, also offered to like regular people with beards and hats uh, and, and tattoos, uh, including uh, quite movingly, uh, if opportunistically, the families of 13 servicemen and women uh, who's uh, uh, who died in Afghanistan during the pullout there. Uh, the author turned Senator uh, J.D. Vance was unveiled as the vice presidential pick. Uh, Tucker Carlson gave a stem winder, uh, as did a fresh out of prison Peter Navarro. Uh, one uh, Trump rival after another on the Tuesday program, especially came out to kiss the ring. I think we heard from every single employee at the Mar-a-Lago uh, Country Club, uh, as well as most of the Trump uh, family, excluding Melania and Barron, who frankly are the ones that I wanted to hear from. Uh, the whole thing was crowned off by a moving, if also totally rambling, 93-minute uh, speech from the former and future president himself. Catherine, I know you were following this all closely for the New York Times. Uh, what were your overall vibes? The overall vibes were kind of what you said. Like, it was a very good convention. It was it was. The timing was good. The speeches were very on message. It seemed like people were having fun. Um, you know, Trump got up and said, wow, this convention has been really nearly perfectly executed. All I have to do is finish strong and then didn't, uh, which was notable. Like he just was like, and now an additional 60 minutes of stuff that's really like D-list material. Um, so that was unfortunate. But also, I think in the end, didn't matter at all. Um the thing that was most notable to me was the total absence of anything that might have resembled the libertarian leg of the three-legged stool that was once a part of conventions as a routine matter. We simply did not hear, like, the words free markets were said almost never the, you know, the I believe the, speech, the only person who said them was uh, Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House. Like, great. <laughs> That's like worse than no one saying them at all. <laughs> um, there, there was, uh, you know, J.D. Vance's speech about, um, you know, America is not just an idea. It's a place. It was like, no, America is an idea. God damn it. Like, first and foremost, and Republicans used to say that a lot. Um, there were just there were many, many things that used to be standard boilerplate and like always to some extent pandering and not really the heart of the party, but all of that stuff was totally absent from the stage. It was cult of Trump. It was America first. And um, if that's what you wanted, they crushed it. But that was not what I personally wanted. 
I disagree just a little bit about the anti-libertarian aspect. Trump totally made an outreach to libertarians about 50 minutes into the speech or so when he was like, we shouldn't tax tips. He, like That's that was awesome. his policy. The, the That's tax how on gonna... tips thing was, the, it was like, <laughs> Trump just made that up like two minutes before the convention and so, everyone was like, this is our whole personality he now. He saw which, Reservoir like... Dogs at the beginning of the summer and it just somehow, the opening scene in which Steve Buscemi is like, I'm sorry the government taxes their tips, but I'm not going to give them extra money, you know, unless they really, unless yeah. they really give great right he saw that movie and then like just rambled that into his speech in june and now that's the policy of the republican party and i do mean the policy because it's the only one I that's think not true that there's might have one been which... the only uh, outside of maybe some mentions of trade tariffs type stuff the only kind of meaningful uh, policy that trump the uh, economic policy domestic economic policy that trump really talked about in that hour and what 40 minute speech there is still school choice, actually. I okay. will I will put one asterisk right, on my remarks and say and? they talked about school choice and they had speakers dedicated to that topic. So that was good. Yes. And sorry, right I, to try. Once yeah. again, yes. Donald Trump, like off the top of his head, because this was yeah. in the riffing part of his speech, went on multiple paragraphs about right to try, as he did in at least two State of the Union addresses. He just loves that yeah. policy. And, right. and, the, uh, and the debate as well. But yeah. there are these like uh, vestigial little policies that Trump likes and they remain in the program and in the platform because Trump likes them. What what we did not hear was any kind of principled defense of free trade, free markets, freedom as the American ideal in the kind of libertarian sense at all. That, yeah, and that that is uh, to I mean, as as a spectacle. Uh, you know, and when you, you you've left out the Hulk Hogan T-shirt ripping uh, moment. And the Kid Rock, so good. you know, censored version of of his foul mouth uh, lyrics. I so had the bad. original lyrics the, up while he was singing, and it was yeah. the most fun that I had for the entire convention because but, he had to pull a punch every single line. It was wild. But this the energy, is, the is energy a stranger there. in the Alps type situation. Yeah. Yes, uh, the energy, the energy there was like powerful. And Matt, uh, we were both at the 2016 Cleveland you know, coronation of Trump, where the best you could get was Scott Bayo. He was like the, yeah. the highest level celebrity. So you see that kind of flipping around and also the Republican kind of establishment being there. They stayed away in 2016. Um, I think in, in lieu, and this is in keeping with the populist message, in lieu of specific kind of policies, what Trump was saying, and J.D. Vance certainly said this a lot, is that, you know, middle America, we've got you. The forgotten man and woman of America, we've got you. We don't know exactly how we're going to do that. And we're going to keep making these complaints about deindustrialization, uh, you know, which have been a, a factor since the 1950s. America has been deindustrializing, but we're, we're going to save those jobs. We're going to get you meaning and purpose and representation back in your life. And from a libertarian perspective, this is awful, to be quite honest, because it's all false and it's all aggrandizement of centralized power, ultimately, in the name of helping the little guy. Uh, but I think it was extremely well executed. I uh, agree with that analysis, Mr. Gillespie. Uh, would also Dr. point out- Dr. Gillespie. Dr. Mister, uh, I forget if we're devaluing that now after the, no. uh, the Lady Macbeth Now that Dr. 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 Jill, Jill is going out, PhDs can come above ground again and <laughs> proclaim their doctors. They've um, suffered for too long in silence, yeah, Nick. That's no. so uh, true. I would recommend people go uh, reread, watch, and listen to Nick's uh, March interview with Patrick Ruffini, the Republican pollster uh, and author of a new book about basically the working class switcheroo of the two major political parties, um, which is something that ha is happening not only in the United States, but uh, in a lot of the other kind of industrialized world. Uh, the working class is shifting allegiances from left party uh, to right parties. And a lot of that, a whole lot of that is cultural. It's cultural signaling, vibes, inclusion, and, and so on, where kind of left parties, and we see this in a huge way in the United States, are kind of about elite, top down, what Rob Henderson calls luxury beliefs, um, and not a small amount of condescension for flyover country and kind of the cultural vibes of that. Um, and uh, there's scant little policy associated with that. Um, and there's a whole lot of just like people with tattoos talking in accents that you don't hear on cable news. Um, and that is kind of weird and wonderful and interesting to watch and observe. Um, I've heard not uh, just from one or two people, 
that we're seeing this kind of uh, Republicans for the first time in a long time, if not quite winning the culture, definitely getting a foothold um, in a lot of different aspects of it that were kind of difficult to imagine before. Um, the uh, other caveat besides the ones that you all mentioned, I think, are just the kind of great man theory itis about it. And Trump has always presented himself this way, like, you know, this this. Terrible thing X would not have happened if Trump was here. Um, we're not going to talk at all about any kind of policy differences that might get you there. Um, there are way too many speeches from way too many people who only kind of know Trump by accident of employment or family. Uh, and all of them just like wanted to let you know that he's not just a regular guy, but he's one of the most amazing regular guys you've ever seen. And he really cares. And he does this and that. Um, some of those stories were kind of moving and interesting, but a lot of them were just like, look at the great man. He's really even greater than you imagine. Um, and I find that really uncomfortable in an American politics. We don't kiss rings. We don't accept coronations, which is what the Democratic Party is trying to do right now with Kamala Harris. Um, but the Trump as great man, we've seen him and he might be changed now that he was almost assassinated a little bit. The scripted part of his speech, the first 25 minutes or so, uh, was kind of genuinely moving and interesting. Um, and I definitely feel for anyone who's almost took a bullet uh, and who did in the case of Corey Compatore, uh, took a bullet for, for the country or in the middle of a political act. Um, but I don't love me any of that great man stuff. And it's just setting yourself up for populist disappointment, which is an inevitable byproduct of populism. All right. I think that's enough of a speech. Um, let us go to our end of podcast, what we've all been consuming in the cultural arena. Peter, why don't you lead us off? I watched the 1992 bad cop neo-noir film, Bad Lieutenant, Abel Ferrara's uh, Harvey Keitel starring movie about a New York police officer who is bad, who is real bad. He does all the drugs. He kills people, steals stuff, works with the criminals, just absolutely an abominable human being who is living on the edge. So the, the recurring uh, like subplot that actually drives along a lot of the action is Matt Welch is leaving as I say this. It's going to be visible in the video. That's why I can talk about it. It's a baseball game or a series of baseball games. It's the World Series of the Championship or something. Um, and he he keeps he keeps betting on these baseball games. And the bets keep going up and he keeps risking more and more money. And of course, at the point where he's risking his whole life and this whole time, he's like, he's again, he's just on absolutely every drug, do like drunk the entire time, yelling, ranting, screaming his way through the mean streets, streets of Manhattan, you know, bodega robberies where he like shoots a gun to like get rid of the two guys who, uh, who, who did it, but then like robs the place himself. And it's just... It's just a kind of incredible document of early 1990s New York, among other things. Uh, at, basically, at, at, the movie came out pretty close to the peak of uh, of New York's uh, crime problem and, and crime wave that uh, you know, sort of peaked through the late 1980s into the very early 1990s. And it's a uh, it's a great looking movie. It has an incredible, super intense Harvey Keitel performance at the center of it, and it's an interesting kind of proto document uh, of. Um, I don't, distrust in the police. Again, not that this, you know, of the kinds of, like you sort of can see in this 1990s movie, uh, the seeds of what would become the, you know, defund the police movement and a lot of the kind of um, pushback to police overreach and, um, and police abuse that we, that now we take for granted. Uh, this movie captures, um, again, not a political moment in the way that we think of it now, but it captures a, a perception of how police conducted themselves in um, one of the you know, sort of most prominent uh, at then, I think you could say New York in the early 1990s was kind of crime ridden. It was really a troubled city in a lot of ways. Um, and the perception was that the cops were not making things better. They were, in fact, a big part of the problem. And they were a big part of the problem because they saw themselves as uh, as powerful individual actors who were above the law. It's bad to be above the law. It's bad to have state agents who are above the law. That's your libertarian lesson for this week. Bad Lieutenant, good movie. Uh, Nick Gillespie, what did you consume? Uh, I uh, consumed Clipped, uh, a uh, Hulu FX series uh, by Gina Welch. That is about the 2014 defenestration of Donald Sterling, the uh, co-owner of the LA Clippers, uh, after uh, a former 
girlfriend, confidant, it's kind of vague, uh, leaked a bunch of taped conversations with him where he was saying shockingly and blatantly racist things. Um, and uh, Ed O'Neill plays Donald Sterling. Uh, you love him for Married with Children. Uh, phenomenal as Donald Sterling. The whole cast is unbelievable. Larry Fishburne uh, plays um, uh, the uh, the coach of the Clippers. It is a great movie about many of the things that we talked about here, about what do you do with employees or owners who destroy the viability of a franchise that that is going through one of its best, basically its best season ever. Um, and it, it taps into race, class, gender, L.A., uh, uh, public, publicity as an issue and as something to exploit. Um, I see it, Matt, and I'm, I'm talking mostly to you, I think, in, in pitching this because I doubt that uh, either of our, our co-panelists will watch it. But it is the it's the it's the answer or it's, it's like a better show about basketball in Southern California than winning time. Because the Clippers is a losing franchise. I mean, they are the Philadelphia Phillies before ever winning anything. It's just a sad sack franchise, but a, a, an incredible prism to look at things like race, class, and gender. And what is great about Gina Welch's cr- construction of all of this is that all of the characters, including Sterling's wife, who was co-owner, including Viv Stiviano, who was the woman who broke the story and is a social climber. Uh, et cetera, uh, Doc Rivers, Larry Fishburne's character. Everybody is both sympathetic and there's something off-putting about them. Uh, there is also great steam room scenes with LeVar Burton as LeVar Burton. Clipped is, Clipped is just one of the best shows that I've seen in a long time. And it talks about so much kind of in like a post OJ Simpson world. It's, it's a spectacular way of, of talking about things that still matter. Uh, that sounds awesome. Uh, I I'll also imagine that uh, notions of like privacy are also kind of thrown in, right? Like yeah. it's a leaked tape. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Bill Maher at the time saying, hey, because everyone was piling on Donald yeah. Sterling. He was like, do we want to live in this world? Really? Uh, and I think he was saying that out of narrow self-interest, it, it, of course. It was enough, you know, and it's 10 years old now, but it was enough of a thing that there is actually a tag for Donald Sterling at reason. <laughs> um, it, and it's it's one of those moments where it was a cultural moment that seemed to, you know, it captivated and captured a lot of energy and then kind of faded. Um, it's also the um, a, a, from a, uh, a, a just operational point of view, the way that uh, Doc Rivers interacts with the players on the Clippers and all of whom are trying to win a championship, but then also pad their own stats, et cetera. It's just on almost from every perspective. It's, it's just a phenomenal show and highly watchable and enjoyable. Awesome. Catherine, please wake up now and tell us what your uh, cultural recommendation is. The only words I heard from Nick's entire monologue there were LeVar Burton in a steam room. That's the only, <laughs> those are the only <laughs> words I heard. <laughs> Truly. Uh, I read um, I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy, which is a great title for a book. Truly a fantastic title for a book. What attracted you to this book, Catherine? Um, My book club ladies gave it to me. And uh, so it's that kind of book. But um, it is truly like a top tier version of uh of this genre of this thing it's a memoir um nick this one's actually for you because it is a it is a memoir that is um haunted by the ghosts of uh teen pop magazine journalism Uh um this is uh the the author of this book was the star it was a star of i carly oh yeah Uh, yeah so a kind of nickelodeon child star um who is she experiences all the things that you think of when you think of like what could go wrong for a child star. Um, but also her mother's, her her wildly, insanely overbearing stage mom um, who has cancer, recovers, and then eventually succumbs to it is kind of the frame of the book. Um, it has a very, very, very strong uh, Amy Sedaris, kind of David Sedaris type vibe to it um and the cover design if you see it you will you will see that they're invoking that on purpose it is fantastically written she clearly wrote it herself and um the thing that's interesting about the book is she has no idea how messed up her life is 
for most of the book. And she tells that incredibly convincingly. Like, it's just like, maybe it's normal for your mom to put you on an 800 calorie a day diet when you're 11 so that you won't experience puberty. Sounds right. She's probably doing it because she loves me. And it's it's so evocatively written. Like, imagine being on the far side of that, having done what seems to be quite a lot of therapy, uh, but still be able to summon that back up to write it so convincingly. Genuinely a talented writer. Um, I guess the kind of takeaway is like, it's hard to know the truth about things when you're in the middle of them. And sometimes that's useful for more than just celebrity memoirs. So I'm glad yeah. my mom died. Are, are we supposed McCurdy. to apply that retroactively to everything that was said on the podcast? And everything everywhere. Everything's about everything, Peter. I told you. Wait, I thought everything was not allowed to be about everything. Except it would be for better if it wasn't, movie. but it is. Uh, I recommend also then uh, following that up, uh, Catherine, with Quiet on the Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV, which is an HBO special about Nickelodeon and the horrors that took place there in its heyday in the late 90s and early 2000s. Sounds There's a, a character who is who is named only as the creator, who is the only unnamed character in the memoir um, uh, for, about whom she is at one point offered hush money to not do things like write this book. Oh, um, so my recommendation is uh, for the third year running, and this will be uh, an annual event for me for a long time. I went to the uh, Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Uh, which is really fun. I recommend it uh, very highly uh, and watch the induction of uh, Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, uh, who's the other dude, Joe Maurer and uh, Jim Leyland. And the one that I'm going to recommend it, recommend because you can watch their speeches online is the speech given by Jim Leyland, former manager of the uh, Barry Bonds Pirates of the world champion Florida Marlins of the Detroit Tigers and at some point, I guess the Rockies. Um, and, uh, I like this genre of speech in general of the baseball hall of fame speech. They're very, you know, they're sort of scripted about 10 minutes long, but it's always awesome to get kind of an old guy. And Jim Leyland as a manager was just like, he looked like he was 105 when he had his first managerial gig. And then he lasted for like 25 years, um, just chain smoking and cussing and everything. And of course, um, in his uh, speech, he then like chokes up. Uh, like two or three times at very uh, critical moments, including when uh, he talked about, you know, coming out of retirement and uh, coaching the world, the American team, the U.S. team at the World Baseball Classic, giving them their only victory so far in that tournament. Uh, also, has just an A plus wife joke in it that I won't spell, uh, spoil, uh, but it's really terrific. So go online, uh, check that out. And uh, again, can't recommend going to the whole thing the whole weekend. Uh, highly enough. It's really fun. Slice of Americana. Mm -hmm. Matt, did he uh, reference at all the uh, performance enhancing drug scandal? Because he, absolutely not. It, yeah. And nor did anyone at some point uh, uh, that it that is sort of seems to be like digested um, through the Hall of Fame uh, uh, in part by rebuffing uh, his most famous former player, Barry Bonds, who he singled out for praise uh, in his speech. Uh, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, uh, a couple of other people who are associated with steroids have been like blocked out of the Hall of Fame by voters. Yet other people who everyone kind of realizes probably did steroids like uh, David Ortiz, Big Poppy is now their most beloved member of the Hall of Fame. Um, so it's just very this weird thing. Uh, I don't like it. I think that the, all those guys should be admitted into the Hall of Fame. It's not totally up to me. Um, but there's, you know, even one of the, uh, the moderators, of the MLB network, who was sort of on stage there, Harold Reynolds, who was a second baseman for a long time. He also was tested positive for steroids and no one seems to really care about that. Um, so it's just just this odd kind of uh, blot um, uh, in the in the game, but still very fun. Uh, At uh, the risk of extending this a second longer, Matt, yep. um, is it what you love about Jim Leyland is that he is the little league coach? that every kid wanted every boy wanted um i appreciate he, he would he would shut down like you know i mean the clips that are probably most circulated about him are him screaming and yelling at barry bonds yeah you know who at that himself. point was the best player in baseball 
but it's like you got to fucking be a team player etc uh there's that they had some good rants about or a good uh, testimony about his uh uh f-bomb tirades and such but it's mostly i miss that uh 70s uh, era of managers uh nick the ones who just are prematurely double aged because of their incessant chain smoking usually alcoholism i don't know in the case of jim leyland uh but uh, uh bill james has convincingly argued that like a shockingly high percentage of good managers were absolute fucking drunk. Um, which <laughs> they is were great. the bad lieutenants of baseball. Yes. Thank yeah. you for keeping your old interest uh, revived, uh, Peter. All right. That's enough of that. Um, thank you all for listening. Maybe we can survive another week of American politics. Maybe not. We'll see you next Monday. Uh, listen to all our podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts. We also have events, including a Bafo one in New York City tomorrow night. Nick, do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, we're uh, going to be premiering a new documentary about Backpage, uh, which you mentioned before, the online advertising site that was hunted down and killed uh, by the by a federal prosecution, which was a joke in the end. Uh, virtually every count against the owners of Backpage was uh, either they were found innocent of or they were dismissed. Um, it's a shame. It's about it's about freedom of speech. It's about freedom of commerce. Uh, it's about sexual liberation. And that's going to be happening in Tuesday, Tuesday in Manhattan. Go to reason dot com slash events to get details and come on out for it. And I if will you, be there. Will you be there, Catherine? I will be there. Awesome. Oh, uh, even better. Um, uh, if you like what we do as an organization, and you really should, uh, please uh, consider giving us a tax deductible uh, donation over there at reason dot com slash donate. Okay, that's all the pitching we have time for. Goodbye. See you next week.